What's up, everyone? Metal Dave here, along with my co-host, Jason McMaster, bringing you another episode of the Talk Louder podcast. Today's guest is Nikki Stringfield, guitarist. You probably know her best as the guitarist for the Iron Maidens. She also plays in a band called Heaven Below. And she is about to release her first full-length solo record called Apocrypha. By the time this episode airs, you will be able to get that record. She is fronting the band for the first time, singing lead vocals for the first time. It's a big deal for her, and uh, we're happy to have her on the show to talk about it. We've heard some cuts. It sounds great. Um, She was just a lot of fun to talk to. And uh, yeah, and she's a Texas girl. So on her, you know, Texas girl goes to L.A., you know. Yeah, I'm going to chime, Iron Maiden. I'm gonna chime in and, and say when her and Patrick got engaged and then married, the ceremonies were in Texas. And I was like, it was family. And, and I, I, I just... Long story short, I had no idea she was from Texas until that moment. And that's been, what, a couple of years now. Yeah. I just didn't even know that she was from Texas. I didn't uh, or Or lived in Austin and went to UT. So there's a lot of things that we found out about Nikki today. Or I'll speak for myself that I found out. <clears throat> and I've kind of known her from afar because, you know, birds of a feather. Right. And she's married to one of my oldest friends, Pat. So there you go. Now the 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 cool uh like front uh topic today is her is her solo record, but Apocrypha. let's talk yeah, Apocrypha, uh coming out end of September, I think she's correct. Saying. Yeah, yes. okay. Out now. And so this will yeah, this so morning. this will air this will air around around the time that uh, her record comes out. So you guys check it out. I was going to say real quick, I'll just ask you, Dave. Dave, how's it going? Good, man. How are good. you? I'm doing good. How many times have you seen Nikki play guitar? I have never seen her play live. What? I don't think I've ever seen her play live. I follow her on social media, so I've seen plenty of videos, and she's amazing. But, but as many times as they've come down and done those shows in San Antonio at Fitzgerald's, yeah, never I seen I, her and I don't do their acoustic so. thing or come through with Heaven Below or you haven't. I don't believe so. No. Wow, that's really too bad. Let me just be the first one in this group of mighty two people to say she fucking shreds. Oh, I know that. I I, I got that from the videos, but I'm sure it's even more impressive in person. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, and and I and I I feel terrible because I'm a native San Antonian and and Pat's from San Antonio and right. she's a Texas girl, and so they do make a point to come back to Texas and and play, but uh, I've never made it to one of the shows. Wow. Oh, well, you you me. must and everyone must see Nikki Stringfield play guitar. Uh, you can find her on YouTube. You can see her play right now. Uh, I want to see if we can dig up some of the videos that she made when she's like 13, <laughs> playing cover songs. You know, events yeah. fold or whatever. <clears throat> yeah. That'd be fun to see. It'd be fun to see because I bet she's yeah. great. She got an endorsement deal from Schechter Guitars because of something they saw when she was 14 years old or whatever. So. Back to what I was saying. There's a lot of stuff that that I don't know if the world knows if you even have heard her name before or have seen the Iron Maidens a hundred times. There may be things about Nikki that you're only going to find out today here on the Talk Louder podcast with Nikki Stringfield. How are you? I'm good. How are you guys? Great, good. great. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm super stoked. Patrick, of course, has just said how fun it is to be on here with you guys. Uh, yeah, well, you know, we go way back with him and he was our very first guest ever on this, on the Talk Louder podcast. So, uh, yeah, we barely got yeah. a word in. <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> he knows how that goes, right? Oh, I was, yeah. I was fully prepared. Oh, God. yeah, I know how that goes. <laughs> that's well, that's why we love him. He He's a, he's a great storyteller and a great talker and he's got a great sense of humor. So. It makes it easy for me because I can just sit here and chill and right. Let him just kind of blah, blah, blah. The, the other thing <laughs> I was going to say is uh, that's the kind of guest we like. Uh-huh. Uh, oh. uh, unless, unless you can't get a word in, 
it's the yeah. it's the guest we like. We we've had some of those too. So uh, a, a a nice balance would be great. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone needs to be able to perform. <laughs> it's an even, you know. Yes. Yeah. That's... Well, let's uh, let's get right into it because there's there's a lot we want to talk about. Uh, but I guess the most timely news is your new album, and by the time this episode airs, it'll be out for a couple weeks. So. Um, I believe it comes out early September. Actually, it comes out September 29th. Okay. Um, so it'll be available by the time people are listening to this, watching this, etc. So tell us a little bit about it, because I know it's your first full length solo release. So a big deal for you. It's been a couple of years in the making. Uh, we did an EP that had five songs and then we added some extra songs to that later on. But this one is called Apocrypha. It's 12 songs. And I just wanted to do something that was just kind of straight rock. Um, I'm singing on it, so that's different. Um, we have Shad Wilhelm on drums, Patrick on a lot of the um, rhythm and fill guitars. We're currently about to start rehearsing next week for the live show for it, for my first ever full band live show. Um, Patrick played bass on it as well. Um, but we're going to have Jesse Davidson do the live stuff. Um, he texts and crews for Lita and he's in his own badass band. So yeah, I'm just super, super stoked to finally get out there and be a front person. Right. So, yeah, so I was gonna, let me, can, if I may jump in, yeah. I'm sorry, Dave. Uh, Go ahead. Is this your first time? I mean, I, I know you're uber badass, extreme kick ass in every way. <laughs> But for someone who doesn't know, like, I have never seen you front. Yeah. Is this the very first time? I mean, surely you've fronted a band for a song, two songs, a set ever? Never? Yeah, not not really. I mean, wow. um, I've done, I've been doing acoustic stuff with uh, Patrick. Um, that's the closest thing. I've done some solo acoustic shows, three hour acoustic sets at the Hard Rock with just by me yourself, and by yourself. Yeah. So that's wow. Okay, that's okay. That's kind of yeah. the same thing. I mean, you're almost nude at that point. Yeah. That one. That's that was probably the most terrifying thing ever. Was transitioning <laughs> from not singing at all to okay, we're going to do these acoustic shows where it's Patrick and I, where we both share lead vocals and we go back and forth on harmonizing to just doing it completely raw all by myself um especially oh. for hours that's a lot of material and i always thought i was really good with lyrics until i uh had to do three hours <laughs> then yeah. i'm like oh my god how does a sweet child of mine start don't go into the wrong verse yeah that's where I, I i uh i i need the number to your therapist because i don't think that i could even do like three songs less three hours by myself yeah uh, because of the nerves you know i gotta have like a bunch of badasses you know like threatening badasses behind me before i can even like surf you know uh so that's excellent yeah that, that's kind of that's that's a little bit about where I was going to go with with my question. That that's that's a great segue because I was going to ask if you're singing on your full length album. Uh, we all know your skills on guitar, and you've obviously recorded guitar in the studio and and some backup vocals and things like that. But what? How is your approach to lead vocals in the studio uh, for a full length album? Woo. Um. I've always loved singing. I've always wanted to sing, but I never had that confidence until really these acoustic shows helped so much. They really helped my voice grow. So getting into the studio for this one, as opposed to my EP where I had never ever sang in front of anybody, it was just, um, it was a completely different experience because Patrick recorded my vocals for both things. And he's such a great coach. He tells, you know, he's so good with it. He tells you how to sing. Um, he'll always be like, ah, you're a little, he never tells you if you're sharp or if you're flat. Go oh, just, just go a little bit above it. And I was like, oh, okay. But yeah. I had a lot more confidence this time around. Um, I would go in knowing exactly what lyrics I would want as opposed to um, 
the EP where I still had a lot to to uh, figure out. But Patrick also helped a lot with the writing process too. But this time I had so much more confidence, and I think it'll really come across in the recording on this yeah. one too. Um, mm -hmm. I have a very soft voice um, as opposed to a very powerful one, which I really I always wanted a super, you know, heavy powerful voice. But you know, I, I grew up listening to evanescence and stuff like that so i think she really had a strong effect on my voice right That's good. Yeah. you know i was i was gonna give pat uh another uh you know trophy here uh i know how lucky you are to have him as your coach and like as like a feather in your hat for while the red lights on while you're in the studio because just having him there because he's so awesome yes just you know and just having him like and and you know that the work that you guys have done together um and the harmonies and stuff that you guys are doing when you guys are doing your duo yes uh you're just kind of like sitting there looking at him going damn damn right so you're kind of soaking that that's a really cool a lot of singers don't who yeah. are kind of up and coming or like, you know, kind of have that man one day, man, one day I got to do that. So that's kind of where I'm going with, with you and, and, and having Pat there. Yeah. To, and, and I got to tell you the history I have with Pat from just fucking so long ago. And just, I didn't even know he sang not to well, turn this yeah. into Pat's thing. A lot of people didn't realize that he sang and I'm talking union underground shit, you know? Yeah when he kind of broke out of that and reinvented himself. Yep. And everybody knows it's, it's well documented now that reinvention. Yes. He came, he was a bat out of hell and I heard him sing and I was just like, Hey man, stop being better than me. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, cause Pat is so the good. first to admit it. He, he, he really worked hard on his yes. vocals because we all knew him it's interesting that we're talking to Nikki right now about her vocals because she's primarily known as, as a great guitarist, but I'm glad we are because I remember, you know, talking to Pat and he said he worked really, really, we knew him as a killer guitar player, great musician, but we didn't really know him much as a singer. And then he worked on his vocals, worked very hard on him. And then I remember him sending me some stuff and I was like, Oh my God, dude, your voice is just like, it's just come leaps and bounds from last I heard it. Not that it was ever bad, but there was a lot of technique and a lot of restraint and a lot of power. And, they, you know, just all that coaching or whatever came together. So he's got to be a great mentor. It's kind of his own, too. He created that. That goes yeah. with reinvention. So back to Nikki, I just think that, dude, just having him there and going, hey, can you show me how to do that? Cool. All right, cool. Got it. Yeah. And then, like, you're putting that in your pocket and like pff, killer mm -hmm. so we're excited about your your record and just yes. like mm -hmm. hoping hoping this just kills it yeah right. so so what are the plans on it you're tell us how many songs uh for people that don't know you what would be the mix of influences and then what are you going to do to hopefully go out and tour it and promote it yeah so i have so many influences it's a uh, 12 songs uh tons of Guitar harmonies. Oh my God. This is my dog, Rolo. Yeah. Oh, hey, awesome. Rolo. Hi, I've seen yeah. Rolo before. He, he shows up in photos. Ridiculous. Oh my God. <laughs> Anytime the camera's on, here we go. <laughs> um, I, I guess when um, our friend Chase, who mastered, mixed and mastered it, he heard a lot of Maiden. Obviously, I play so much Maiden all the time. That's going to come out regardless. Um, Avenged Sevenfold was a huge influence of mine growing up hearing because it was I was 14, I think, when City of Evil came out and it was new, like lead guitars were were kind of back. And I was like, yes, just solos everywhere. Um, so it's got I feel like it's got that, of course. Um, I'm a big ballad person. There's only one or two. There's well, two. But I love the edge, the a touch of creepiness here and there in the album. I'm a pretty weird person. I love horror movies. So a lot of stuff lyrically with that. But it was written a lot lyrically during the pandemic, too. So it was a bunch. It's a lot about isolation and not really being sure what's going to happen. We didn't know if we'd ever be seeing people again or if we could see our families 
in Texas when we were on this crazy lockdown here in California. So you were, a lot of you were sort of lyrically, it sounds like you were beginning yeah. in the dark. Yes. There's you a were in a zero yeah. place, right? Yeah. You were like blinders, kind of like what's what's gonna happen when I open the front door? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. There's a song called Lunacy that's kind of about the pandemic, just being unsure of you know, everybody was just attacking each other. Um, nobody knew what was gonna happen. So a lot of the songs are kind of about that. But at, it's actually very musically a, a happy sounding song. So I always like to have those kind of contrasts. But I'll be doing um, two shows in Arizona in December with the live band. We have my album release party on the 28th here in Hermosa Beach. Like I said, the very first one ever. So we're really, really, really stoked for that one. Yeah. We start rehearsals next week. Um, we just recorded a music video for the first single um, on. I don't know what my days are anymore. Month, it was Tuesday. So a couple of days ago. Yeah. So yeah. Nine hour shoot with What's the name of the song? It's called Where the Demons Lie. Perfect. So it, it, Sounds it, like it, a it, pandemic it, song. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's like a horror movie from what we could see on the uh on the screen. So it, it looks so looks so awesome from, from yeah. all I, I follow you on social media and I saw some shoots from the video shoot and our, our pal David Castillo was there taking some photos and some still shots, I guess. And uh, yeah, it, it looks like it kind of the the imagery conveys the the song title. So when yeah. can we see the video? Ooh, I'm really hoping that it's going to be done at the end of September, um, right before the album release. So we can really push that and help push the album. So hopefully, mm -hmm. hopefully the last week of September, we'll be releasing that, um, to coordinate with the whole release. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking behind you and I see your guitars hanging on the wall. How did you get your deal with Schechter? Man, that goes, that goes way back. So you said Avenged was one of my favorite bands, Papa Roach too, and they all played Schecters. So naturally my first guitar was a Schecter at age 14. And I just played them ever since I was just obsessed with them. And um, I started posting YouTube videos when I was about 17 or 18, just in my room playing covers and everything. And, and one day I saw uh, Schecter posted a picture of me on their Facebook. I was like, oh my God. Wow. You know, little, little kid from middle of nowhere, Texas, Red Oak, Texas. It's like, oh my God, I was freaking out. And then I went to college in Austin and then moved to Los Angeles through an internship for a radio, TV, and film. And I got to go to NAM and I met them and and I just went every day, networked my ass off because I knew nobody. I came out to LA knowing no not a single person. And next thing I know, they gave me a job being the receptionist and gave me an endorsement, sent me home with two blackjacks to choose from. And that's still one of my favorite guitars I've ever had. I love that. Wow. Love that, that is like a fantasy story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is. I still, I still cannot believe it happened. I'm still like, how, how did I get so, so lucky? But so well, you, 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 you championed what you fell in love with. Yeah. There you and go. I think that that kind go. of pays off if you're, it's not so much that you, your plan was, okay, I'm in it to win it. I'm in it to win it. Obviously you are, but the, but just the fact that, you know, something, po Hey, wait, that's a picture of me on the Schechter site. And you're, so that kind of obviously led to some phone calls yeah. and then snowballs. Yeah. So, uh, you're you're in Texas at what age growing right. up did mm -hmm. you have a band in Texas what is your musical beginnings yeah, that's funny I had nothing in Texas my oh. little town um I had nobody to play with so that's why I moved to Austin to go to UT thinking it's the live music capital of the world I I have to find people to jam with there and um uh, and nothing we still didn't I was I was traveling so much out of town to go to concerts. I had friends. I'd made friends all over the state going to concerts. And I just, I didn't find anybody still. So it was as soon as I moved to LA, bam, bam, bam. I was in several, several different projects. I got, I started playing with the Iron Maidens a couple of months. It was in April. I moved in January. My first show with them was right after my 
22nd birthday in April. Wow. And then I joined an original band at the same time. And the, that was actually on my 22nd birthday. So wow. I started these two, two different things. Just that was my first time on a stage. Wow. <laughs> so, that's that just crazy. You, you, yeah. Is it safe to say you'd never even played with a drummer, which is can be vital. I think the only time I had really played with the drummer was when I went and jammed with like my dad and his band. Holy yeah. okay. crap. So, so you had, you had yeah. at least one musical parent. So there was, so you were brought up maybe in a household where music was around or even if it wasn't live, maybe dad's got a stereo. Do you remember the first moment that music sort of crept into your brain and, and specifically when rock and roll became something so attractive that you felt like you were going to pursue it? Yeah, luckily I had two, or I have not had two awesome parents, both into rock and metal. Like they just, they just went and saw Buck Cherry and Skid Row last night. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. So luckily my mom would take me to shows all the time. And as far as I could remember, my dad would be playing guitar and he was in a band called uh, Medicine Man, or they would be jamming Maiden or ACDC's, his favorite, you know, one of the favorites, their cats yeah. are named. Malcolm and Angus. So I, I was surrounded by it. Sounds it, like and... I need to meet this man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We've probably bumped into him at a at a show somewhere. Probably. probably. Excuse me. Excuse me, man. <laughs> been your dad. Hey, awesome shirt. Could have been your dad. Right. Right. Yeah, totally. And so what was the biggest culture shock for you? So you you grew up in a in a very small town in Texas outside of the Dallas area, as I understand it. So what was the biggest culture shock from going to small town, Texas to L.A.? Because it's obviously an entirely different pace. And and speed. what year was that? Yeah. Let's see. I moved from Red Oak. Luckily, going to Austin in 2008 definitely helped that jump. Had had I not lived in Austin for three and a half years, I think it would have been like a what the hell? You know, what is what is going on? Because that's Austin's very much like a little mini LA in the sense of traffic, yeah. uh, parallel parking, which I still hate because that's, <laughs> we don't have to do that in the country. What is, what is parallel parking? Right. Um, and I moved to LA January, 2012. Okay. So, okay. Uh, 11, 11 years now, which is crazy, but, um, it was, you know, and I lived in Hollywood kind of right off the bat. So it was just it was insane how I was just thrown into it all and and I quickly realized how small the music world is like everybody knows everybody mm -hmm. kind of thing and um I just kind of got thrown into it it was extremely overwhelming especially because I'm I've always been a very quiet uh honor honor roll kind of nerd goth nerd uh so I had to learn how to get <laughs> overcome that real quick to uh, live in this world here. I've, I've noticed that a lot of my friends that live in L.A., they are they are not bashful people and they have no problem talking. And and I have this theory and, and, and one of my buddies told me that's that's exactly right. If you don't speak up in L.A., you get drowned out and thrown aside. So you're constantly hustling, constantly talking. You might not necessarily be bragging about yourself, but you're you can't be a wallflower and get anywhere in L.A. That's a thousand percent true. And um, yeah. even if we're tired, you know, just like coming coming home the other day, we've just been constantly touring nonstop to where I'm just exhausted as hell. But then it's like, oh, no, we have to go out tonight. We can't miss can't miss our friends show. We can't not go do this. So it's constantly. There's just a million things that you have to do and be on for here. That is like, yeah. oh, God, I have to put on makeup today. Shit. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right. because because going to a gig, I hate that. If, you're, if you're in a uh, a working band mm -hmm. who is looking for more footprint, yeah, or has a new product, which could be the same thing, it's a meet and greet. Yeah. You got to go. It's a five day meet and greet. Kind of yep. like the that's what Todd Latore calls the monsters cruise. Five yeah. day meet and greet. And he's not wrong. So I've adapted that. Yeah. Yeah. We're about to go on the five day meet. And, I mean, monsters of rock. 
<laughs> the same shit. You That's mentioned when you got to LA, you got uh, you joined up with the Iron Maidens pretty quickly, and you mentioned an original band. Was that band by chance uh, Femme Fatale with Lorraine Lewis? Were you in that band at one point? I, I was in that one too. Yeah, okay. I, uh, I started playing in that one probably a few, maybe a year or two later, maybe a year later. Um, but I had joined, it was a brand new band called Before the Morning. It was like a heavy melodic metal band, you know, screaming okay. verses, singing during the chorus. So Let's talk about the Iron Maidens because it, it's, a, it's one of those... I don't know if it's fair to say rare, but I'm going to go ahead and say rare. It's one of those rare tribute bands that's actually pretty damn successful and has uh, an international following, which is yeah. extremely rare. Uh, you know, every town has their cover band or whatever. Um, but you guys, uh, you girls, tour uh, plenty. You've been around for a while. You've obviously got the talent. It's, it's, Tell me, Iron Maiden, which is your favorite singer, Diano Dickinson or Blaze Bailey? I have to go with Dickinson. Okay. I have met Diano, and we have played with him in uh, London before. He got up and played two songs with us, and that was pretty awesome. Really? Diano got up and sang with the Iron Maidens? Yeah, it was, um, I forget, mate, God, it must be five, four or five years ago now. Wow. Yeah, in London, and he came up and sang Wrathchild and iron maiden i believe wow well, and, and members of maiden have actually been in the audience and watched you guys play before is that correct yeah i think that was probably before me because the band has been around for about 21 yeah. years now yeah which is, which is crazy hard, and it's, hard, it, it's hard for me i apologize to pinpoint who was actually on guitar in the iron maidens when legendary things have happened to the group oh, but yeah, but I do. I have heard the pretty awesome stories. Well, the mm -hmm. fact that they've been around like that, that just proves my point that, yeah. I mean, you're, you know, you know, a tribute band doesn't last 21 years unless there's an audience for it and there's some success along the way. So congratulations on that. And I assume you're still part of that. I think I saw you're, you're doing some dates with the Iron Maidens at some point here. Yeah, yeah, we've been so so crazy busy this year we we opened um for accept on tour for about i was gonna a bring that up oh nice i talked to i talked to wolf today we're trying to get him on the podcast so oh nice that yeah. was that whole band uh just the nicest guys mm -hmm. we had so much fun it was such a fun tour and they're funny I mean, too those guys are, oh we had I mean, so Oh, that's between funny. uva and wolf running around talking german the whole time oh, and then yeah. breaking into english and telling jokes uh -huh. to to philip and christopher like what oh, it, made, it made my head spin hanging out with those guys uh yeah, yeah just the best the best people I'm, i was so happy when i i saw linda's uh post about that announcement and i was like what what and then a couple of days later what so yeah we're a tribute band and we're getting to go open for accept in europe like for legends yeah i rest my case this is the point i've been making yeah. for the last five minutes i mean that's a that's a very rare tribute band that can last that long get that that kind of uh pick up that kind of tour and have dave, the dave it means you're badass I, yeah it does exactly yeah kind of what um, it means so thankful. Tell me a little bit about, I didn't know this about you until I started doing my homework because I knew we were going to have you on the show, but uh, you're you're quite an artist. You like to draw, and that was one of your first uh, yeah. passions, I guess. And I saw a piece of your artwork on your website. It was a, I think it's a rose of some sort. It's a flower of some sort. Yeah. Um, tell me about how you got into that and if you if you managed to have time to continue to do it and if you've used any of your artwork on your you know your music projects tell me a little bit about that yeah that was my first love was a uh, drawing basically anything that i can see i can draw and the more colors the better um i started out just I think my whole family is pretty artistic, whether it be music or drawing. My Nana is such a talented painter. So is my uncle and my aunts. Um, so I just got these Prismacolor pencils. My uh, Somebody in my family gave them to me a long time ago. And I just started when I was 13. Everybody in school knew I'd finished my work 
really fast and I would just get to drawing and people would pay me to draw them stuff. And uh, then I just started doing musicians, my favorite musicians. I I think um, I drew Kurt Cobain when I was 13. And that's, I don't, I think I'll have to post that. I keep meaning to get all of my stuff out and post it because I think I've never done anything better than that. And I was probably 13 or 14. Wow. Please do. I think uh, yeah. you heard it here on, first on the Talk Louder podcast. <laughs> yeah. that, uh, yeah. Springfield's I think Kurt he's going to have to get to work and do some <laughs> scanning and posting. I yes, know. Yes, exactly. I, now I pretty much draw skulls. I love skulls. Skulls. Wow. And <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm kind of obsessed with skulls as well. I, I think we all are. Yeah. I think you have to be to even be on the show and to listen to the show. <laughs> yeah, right. That's my whole my whole place looks like a, you know, it's Halloween time, but Halloween <laughs> every day. My favorite era of Kiss is '74, where Gene just has the kind of like skull. It's kind of like a yeah flat mocked up bad halloween skull and cry like a jolly roger or something and it's yeah. my favorite shit ever right it's like keep all the dream. demon armor you can have all that i want the but that the weird the weird the... skull shirt that's like sewn on to the black sh oh my god yeah. so yeah. crude and perfect nikki what's your first concert as a kid it's not metal i can tell you that's that, okay right? that's okay it's Backstreet Boys. Oh, wow. <laughs> in okay. the nosebleed section. In the nosebleed section. I couldn't oh. even see anything. You're the first guest we've ever had on the show after two and a half years that said their first concert was the Backstreet Boys. <laughs> Let me see what you remember about it. Did you see a band on stage? I, you know what? It was so, so up high. I went with my mom and my aunt and I was so young and I don't remember much. I remember I was so nervous and shy that I didn't even really get up out of my seat. Couldn't really see much at all, but probably, you know what? There was probably no band on stage. I could barely see them. They were like little ants down there. Mm. But that experience, here's the thing that I think we all have in common. Your, your first concert, whether you look back on it and cringe or whether you get to say, I saw Thin Lizzy in 1976 or whatever, you know, the thing is, what gets down in your bones is just the excitement of the arena. You've never seen or heard anything like that before, and you're just overwhelmed by it. And it's either going to take hold or it's not. And to some people, it just becomes disposable entertainment. But there's some people where it's like, I got to do as much of this as I can. And maybe I'll even be that person on stage. Did you feel that when you saw the Backstreet Boys? Was it that level of excitement or were you too young to really... Yeah. process it all yet i don't think i had a guitar at that point I i've always loved music i've always loved singing and everything but i will say the, the first time that i really remember that is i had called in to try to win tickets to see evanescence and i was probably 13 at that time and i called in and accidentally won i don't know how that happened <laughs> but I remember my mom and i went and picked up the tickets and we didn't know what they would be but we it was the first time that I had ever been in the pit. And I think that right there, I walked out and I'm like, oh, I'm so close to the stage and everybody just looks, you know, they're right there in your face. And I, I think that might've been the first time where I was like, I really want to be up there doing that. I can do that. I can totally be up there playing that guitar and having, and then after that, I, I would not go to a show without being front and center on the pit. I would get there so early in the morning and I just had to be right there. And I was just, that's when I really knew I really wanted to be up on that stage. Did, would yeah. you, would you lean towards addiction? That was my whole life. Yeah. 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 I think all oh, of us, you know, so once we discovered it, everything else went out the window. You I was a sports, you. I was a sports nerd. And then, and then, then I discovered kiss and it was everything else took the back seat If it didn't just get jettisoned on the highway. You, when you find your tribe, you cannot, you, you, your soul belongs to it and you cannot hide it. You can't keep, you can't keep it at bay. Your parents can't, you sneak out, you go, no matter, you cannot be held from it. And that's what the organized religion is afraid of. That's why they're afraid of rock and roll because, <laughs> because that is our church and that is, makes us feel alive and, and, and it becomes love. It's love. Yeah. And it's important. Yeah. It's important to you. And, uh, 
and you you thrive in it. I think that that all of our parents, once they finally realized that, and they sort of I hate to say gave in to your your fad. Ah, oh, yeah. it's a phase. Well, They're going to grow out of it, da, da, da. and then you never do, and they have to respect it by the time. Damn, Jason, you're 60 years old, and I guess it wasn't a fad. You know, yeah. I was going to say we're both like half a century older than Nikki, and, and even we're still going through the phase. <laughs> but you can't, right? But you can't. You know, no one can get mad at it when you've been able to. And this sounds kind of weird. Support yourself. I get it. I I knew you were by being be an artist. By being yeah. creative, by being in this tribe, by being yeah. and being a good person and yeah, never so, been to jail and you know, all of the continue. things that the bad rep that that, you know, you see some tattooed long hair freak, you think, oh, he's a criminal. Oh, they're a bad person. Uh, no. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, no. You just I, never let go of your passion. My favorite thing Nikki said is that you were a nerd and you were on a roll yeah. <laughs> and you keep yeah. going back just this for a second and like not self deprecation, but you're like, yeah, I was on a roll and I would finish my work real quick just so I could draw and be creative. I could draw a skull. You've mentioned it a few times, <laughs> but you're not yeah. dwelling on that brains, you know, nerd yeah. so to, to play to build on that so yeah. your parent you mentioned you mentioned your parents were were musical and i mean they they have to be really proud of of where you are and what you're doing you're about to put out your first full-length solo record they just went and saw skid row and buck cherry so they're obviously into the they're still in the game and how proud of a moment can we is get that their address you? can we have their phone yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, we just yeah. want to say thank you. We want to you. invite ourselves over for dinner. <laughs> we want to say thank you for just kick ass parenting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, so, I mean, yes. that, that's got to be very rewarding for you and for them as well. So yeah. tell, tell us about the, you know, maybe the first time that they saw you on a stage in front of an audience and, and the reception you got. And I mean, they had to be super proud of you. Yeah. I think everybody, you know, my family is super very close. I don't have brothers or sisters, but I have a ton of aunts, uncles, cousins, and we're all super close to this day. And I think everybody was just kind of shocked that I actually did go out and do this because I, I said I was going to, but like I said, shy, you know, just nobody really thought I would actually pursue it. But the first time I believe that they saw me on stage was um, they drove out nine hours to El Paso to see the Maidens um, play there because we hadn't played around Dallas yet. So they drove nine hours to see us in El Paso and they fly out a lot to shows. They're going to fly out for my album release show next month. Nice. So, yeah, they're super. And they've never seen me do the acoustic set, which we'll be doing a three hour acoustic set the next night wow. uh, too. So yeah, they're, they've always been so, so supportive. Um, even though I, like you were saying how they think it might be a fad, you know, ah, you need to wear something other than black. Oh, you'll, you'll change one day. Oh, the color of my hair changed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's about it. Well, yeah. all they have to do is look in the mirror and realize it's, it's more than a fad. I mean, they're still going to rock shows and, and enjoying it. So more power uh, to them. Yeah. 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 Uh, I actually took them on um, the monsters of rock cruise a couple of years back. So oh, like wow. yeah, they they never have left the country. They've never done anything like that. I was like, why don't you just come and share my cabin? And uh, you know, I'll I'll sleep in the little bunk. I'll climb up in the little bunk thing. And uh, yeah. Oh, it was so much fun. They had a blast. That's awesome. Yeah. What what is the? I want to go back to the Iron Maidens for a minute. What was the? What's the biggest audience you've ever played for with the Maidens? Ooh, um, we've. I think the biggest they've played is before me um, in Venezuela, but God, we've played to some huge crowds, especially in Mexico, South America. Um, a lot of the places in Germany that we play are just, man, it's, it's like, how are we playing in front of this many people? It's a, it's a trip. We're playing a, a festival called Life After Death. Life After Death Music Festival in Mexico City in December. Um, it's a three-day, I think it's a three-day 
thing, but we're on the first day. And I think it's a bunch of, I think Lita is on it, Doro, a bunch of uh, female bands on that day. But I bet that one's going to be pretty big too. So, so you mentioned now, Lita Ford, and I think most of our listeners know your your husband, Patrick Kennison, plays guitar for Lita Ford. So, and now you've got this solo career that you're launching. Is there ever going to be a point where your two careers kind of, you know, he's got to go do the Lita tour and you're trying to do your solo tour and he's part of the solo band, but uh, he's he's committed to the Lita thing. And I mean, have you guys had that discussion? Boy, that is the hardest thing. You should see my calendar that I have of trying to be like, when are we both home? Okay. Oh God. Okay. Let's, can we, let's stick an acoustic show here. I hate saying no to anything. And it, and then I end up hating myself later. Cause I'm like, great. We're going to rehearse this day. Then we have an acoustic gig. Oh yeah. I stuck a three hour acoustic gig after my first show. Like I'll probably really be kicking myself for that one, but <laughs> yeah, it, it's quite challenging right now, especially with our, our two crazy schedules to get anything done, but yeah. Yeah, how we, are you we, how are you um keeping your voice up uh situational like that where you have your your live show which is i don't know what 90 minutes and then you're going to do a three hour acoustic thing the next day how are you how are you expecting to hold up or is that do you know how you're going to hold up is that experience um this will be a uh, this will be a new one wow okay <laughs> and, uh, haven't yeah. been there before luckily It'll be Patrick too. So if you know, right. I'll have okay, to yeah, back a lot on. We we pretty much, it's a pretty fair split in the acoustic set. You'll be um, fine. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. some of the songs that I normally sing, he can take over if needed. Um, so I know it'll just be a lot, a lot of water, and then um, a lot mm -hmm. of water, and hopefully some decent sleep the night, a couple of nights before. Yeah, you know, every, everybody, just real quick, everybody think has these different concoctions about how they keep their voice. And you just, you just covered it. In my book, it's hydration and sleep. Yes. If you sleep, take care of yourself, eat something and drink a lot of water, you're going to find your voice the next day. Yeah. You're going to be fine. Yeah. But you have to know that, you know, because what about throat spray? You know anybody that uses that? Oh, I know the throat coat, the the tea, but tea? I don't really know the throat the throat spray. spray. Uh -uh. My my thing about that is, is if you have it and then you don't have it, uh, you get it gets in your head like, what am I yeah. gonna do? I don't run out of my spray. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, water uh, and sleep. The yeah. uh, you know you you keep mentioning the acoustic uh shows and and i love the clips that you and patrick post on your social media stuff because you guys first of all you work very well together and i love the songs that you tackle because a lot of them aren't traditionally acoustic type songs like i love the iron maiden's ace is high yeah um i love the version of alice in chains down in a hole that you guys did and I think that's your vocal in the back that just really, as you were talking about adding a creepy haunting sort of element to a, to a song, if that song, that song's already as creepy as they get, but your voice in there, cause your voice, like you said, is, is kind of soft. So it's almost this angelic voice speaking in a very dark song and it works so well. So Anyway, I think people should check out some of the stuff that you've done because you guys do really great renditions. But my question is, have you and Patrick ever sat down to try and tackle a song and just said, man, we just can't we can't pull this one off? Good question. That's a really good question. Because um, we have so many songs that we want to bring in to the yeah. set. We we haven't tried it yet, but we really want to do uh, The Devil Came Down to Georgia all on the acoustic mm. don't yeah. know if we're going to be able to pull it off but uh we really want to try that one that's yeah. a great song it's a great yeah. song a lot of picking that's a lot of yeah it's going to be a lot I'm like really that's that's going to be a lot of a shred but we do i mean we did avenge sevenfold's backcountry on acoustic so yeah didn't think that would work but it actually works real well so what about something like uh dreamer deceiver Ooh. oh that's right up patrick's alley oh, 
Yeah. Yeah, he'll probably yeah, but can, do you now. guys sing that way? <laughs> do you guys sing that cuz it's it's in the stratosphere. God, that would be that one would be a challenge. Yeah. Really who challenge. who would out of you or Pat who who do you think would take that head voice? You know what? Because the <laughs> early the early verses are I can hear either of you guys do that beautifully. Yeah. Talk about haunting, right? Mm. He can hit crazy high notes. Oh yeah. I think I think he can hit higher than I can, to be honest. Wow. He, he's doing um, Boston's uh, More Than a Feeling. Yeah. So, that. And uh, yeah. he's been, he started doing that one solo just because we haven't been home to do a, a gig together in a while. <laughs> he's, well, well, he would just send me clips like, look, here's that high, the crazy high note. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I so saw that's that. My, that great. Do, you, do you have a request? line i can call dreamer deceiver Jason mcmaster <laughs> wants you guys to do dreamer deceiver <laughs> now we're gonna have to do it yeah and you know if they record so it, they're gonna call you for guest vocals well uh -huh. they don't they i, I can't wait but they don't have to do that <laughs> i want to hear them do it dave That's no, i want to hear them do it too yeah. but you know they'll they'll say you know jason suggested this so we feel it's only right to add him to the mix so i didn't mean it that way yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Apocrypha, tell us uh, again, it comes out the end of September. It'll be out by the time people are watching and listening to this. Uh, you're going to put together as much touring as you can to support it. Um, are you already working on a second album? Actually, not a solo album, but we are going to uh, put full focus now that mine is almost completely out there on the new heaven below album and right. that, okay it, that was really cool uh, it's already mostly done i think patrick has so many songs to choose from but i have to get in there and record my parts but i was like wouldn't it be so cool to link this album to the heaven below album so the last song unite we recorded super last minute and it is going it's just a very short clip and patrick's on it too singing but it transitions into the heaven below album so if you were to listen to the end of mine going into the beginning of the new heaven below it kind of transitions into that sequence nice. Nice. so i wanted to I, I wanted to be cool with it you know i was like yeah. what can you do to combine these two things in a in a way they're not related but in a way they can the heaven below record uh that you put out dearly dearly departed is that um, I think oh, that was the title. It's it's the, all the cover tunes. There's oh the, yeah, yeah. Rest in pieces. Yeah. TV. Rest in pieces. Okay. Um, the so, the song selection on that. If people listening should go check that out. You know, it's rare that I endorse a, an entire album of cover tunes. But first of all, the selection of tunes is great, and second of all, the execution is is awesome. You either change them just enough to make them interesting or you nail them so well and add a little added modern day punch to it that it really kind of brings it up to date. I was, I was really impressed with that. And I think that's the one um, that has the Alice in Chains song on it. Um, it's got Dio's hungry for heaven. Uh, the song that I was never a fan of this band and I know Patrick is, but I've never been a fan of Lincoln park, but your version of that, song, I think it's called crawling calling yeah oh my god the, that's so well done it almost made me a lincoln park fan and i probably do owe it to those guys almost. to go back and listen to almost but their version is really well done so anybody listening and or watching this if you want to hear a great selection of cover tunes done really well check out that heaven below uh that that cover record and Thanks. speaking of heaven below and and patrick Did so you notice that rollo turned into a cat yeah he turned into a very large black mm -hmm. cat. Like some cat. sort of magic trick over yeah. there. Well, that's, you know. <laughs> that's the fat ass we call her. Yep. Oh, okay. Okay. So this isn't the first time we've had pets on the show. Pets no, creep into no, the, we, into we the like show all the time. We love them. Yeah. 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 So here's a question for you, for you, Nikki. Um, when you're, you, when you're working with Pat, um, Obviously, I get the sense you've basically sort of given me the sense that you've learned a lot from him. Oh. Have you have you guys ever been in the studio or sitting on the couch jamming acoustic guitars or whatever? Have you ever inadvertently taught him something? 
hmm. where he was like, wait a minute, I should try that. Or I, what'd you do there? Uh, I will say, because, you know, he's such a good teacher. I'm self-taught. I don't know theory. I wish I did. That's something I still want to learn. But so I just go into writing solos and stuff. Just what is what sounds right to me. Um, and he has said um, like a, a couple of the solos on the new album. He's like, oh, he's like, interesting. It's a very interesting note choice. He's like, if you would have had theory, you probably would not have chosen that. But it works. Yeah. But it's different. So he'll be like, oh, that's that's really interesting. Or yeah, I had to learn a ton of Journey songs. Um, and he's like, God, you, you learn all that by ear, but you don't know the theory behind it, which is, he's like, that's really crazy. Um, so I think that's, yeah, I don't know if I've really taught him anything because God, he knows just just like everything. The the vocal harmonies, I, like I said, I've just learned so, so, so much from him. I'm kind of the more, um, the more business aspect of it. I, you know, we, we balance each other out so well. Yeah. But that, and, that answered my question, not necessarily that you taught him anything per yeah. se, but made him raise an eyebrow and go, wow, I would have never thought to do it that way. And it's interesting because I, I, I hear this a lot with guitar players. There are those ones that are self-taught that, you know, and, and some of them become worldwide international famous. And they're always famous because people say they have their own signature sound. They've, they've yeah. created a sound. And I think, and they, they would say the sound is because it was all what I like to call a happy accident. They weren't structured. Their approach was not schooled. There was no really theory involved. They went with their instincts. And fortunately they had good musical instincts to begin with, but it's, it's that, it's that approach that kind of comes out of left field that will help you sort of develop a sound that's unlike others. Yes. So that's cool. Then, so if you're self-taught and you know, you're, you're, you're off on your solo career and you're already a great player, obviously, but you know, maybe there'll be a day somewhere down the road where we're reading about Nikki Stringfield, the un the unschooled, self-taught guitar player who blazed her own trail and is ranked up there with Michael Shanker. <laughs> who is also self-taught. Michael yeah. Shanker, right? No theory. That's what I thought. He plays what he feels. Yeah. Yeah. That's There's this that, other guy, Jimmy plays left-handed. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um Jimmy <laughs> Hendrix. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't go by th no theory right uh, there don't quote me on this but from there's the heart, a story right? say again it's got to come from the heart that's right yeah exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah um there's a story that and like i said no one out there in interweb land hold me to this do not threaten my life if you want to debunk this story but i hear a story from different sources that Jimmy was asked to play on a Miles Davis record and Miles Davis sent all the charts over to Jimmy and knock on the hotel room. Yeah. A delivery, it's a big envelope with charts and Jimmy laid them all out and he's like, what the hell is all this? And had to call Miles Davis back and go, I'm sorry, I can't do it. I can't, this is gibberish to me. I can't, I don't know what this is. And it seems like Miles would have just been like, Jimmy, just come on down and plug in and just vomit all over my record. And it would have been this incredible moment for everyone. But I think Jimmy, I wouldn't say got scared, but he, or intimidated, it's Jimmy fucking Hendrix. No one was there, but the story goes that he had to call Miles and back out because he couldn't read the charts, didn't know theory. <laughs> It's amazing, right? Jeez. It's kind of crazy, right? Yeah. But he's Jimmy fucking Hendrix. I'm just yeah. saying that the fantasy about Jimmy on a Miles record sounds yeah. like perfect. And it didn't happen because of that. Leap. That lack of, that lack of yeah. formal training, I guess. It's, it's, yeah. just, it's just weird to me and not really that weird because there's a lot of uh, virtuosos who can't don't know their alphabets. So, Right. Right. Oh. Well, Nikki, uh, we know that uh, 
you're, we know you know your alphabet, and uh, and we're and we appreciate or you. Does she? Here. She doesn't need to know it. I'm yeah. talking the musical alphabet. <laughs> talking theory. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. No, we wish you all the best with Apocrypha, your very first yeah. full length solo album. You're going to go out on tour and front your very first solo band for the first time ever. I think that's amazing. I think it's fantastic. I, I hope that being from Texas, we can expect you to have some dates in Texas so that all of us here in Texas can get out and see you and uh, and meet your parents, your rad parents. I'll be there. <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. If you yeah. check it out, promise me if I'm in the room and like 10 feet, 50 feet over is your dad or wh whoever, you need to walk over and go, hey, y'all need to meet. Jason wants your autograph. I want to shake their hand. <laughs> <laughs> my dad and I look so much alike. People think he's my brother. So if you see a dude that looks like me or yeah, that's, that's my dad. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. We'll look out for your, your, the, the male version of you. Well, I might be going Nikki, Nikki yeah. <laughs> and get closer and go. He turned around. It's like, uh, <laughs> maybe not. Okay. Close, but no guitar. Yeah. Oh, uh, see what ooh, I That was there. a good one. But um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Nikki, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, we wish you uh, huge success with your album, Apocrypha. What's your website? Where can people go and learn more about you? It is just www.nikki-stringfield.com. Nikki-stringfield.com, folks. It's got her merch, her T-shirts, her albums, and her artwork. Uh, go check that out. And uh, we'll look for you on tour. Best of luck with the record. Give our love to Patrick. It was great talking to you today on behalf of my co-host, Jason McMaster. I'm Metal Dave Glessner with our special guest, Nikki Stringfield on the Talk Louder podcast. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. yeah.